Welcome along, welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your uh, weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, today we're joined by Lauren Y. Uh, she's at Stanford University, and she's working on, uh, as she'll tell us, uh, <coughs> Cassini radar measurements of Titan. Um, and Lauren uh, did her undergraduate work at University of Virginia in computer science uh, and uh, electrical engineering, and now she's in electrical engineering at Stanford. Uh, <coughs> where she's working on uh, on the uh, Titan material that she's going to cover today. So thanks very much for coming along, Lauren. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, as the title suggests, I'm going to be talking about a specific feature on Titan, Ontario Lacus, which is, as I'll show, the largest lake in the south polar region of Titan. Um, this work is done by my advisor, Howard Zepker, and I at Stanford, and then also um, several members of the Cassini radar team. So I'll begin by uh, just doing an overview of Titan, the moon, um, and then focusing on the lake features that we've been observing and the specific lake feature, Ontario Lacus. I'll then go over scattering theory um, and a specific radar experiment that we call the T-49, the 49th flyby of Titan, which, whose data we acquired in December of last year, and then our analysis of the backscatter and modeling of the roughness of the Ontario Lacus Lake that we retrieved from this data. And finally, I'll, I'll review the implications for wind speeds and material properties um, based on these results. So to start, um, Titan is the largest moon of Saturn, as I'm sure everyone knows. It's um, about a third of the size of Earth with a significant atmosphere, um, 900 kilometers. Okay, sure. Um, it uh, has an atmosphere about 900 kilometers tall, um, and it's composed significantly of nitrogen, similar, similarly to Earth, but um, its secondary component is methane instead of oxygen. And um, as you can see in this figure, it's covered all the time by optical or by cloud covers that impede optical observations. Um, if we can look beneath these clouds, we can observe the surface uh, where we find a uh, extremely cold surface, a 94 Kelvin, below 90, slightly below 94 Kelvin temperature, and a slightly higher pressure than we have on Earth. Um, and the gravity is also significantly lower, about 14%. We can look through the atmosphere at specific wavelengths, um, at infrared and optical wavelengths, to see a heterogene heterogeneous, heter heterogeneous surface, as you can see here. Um, and then with the radar instrument, we can, um, whereas optical uh, wavelength is constrained by sunlight refle uh, reflection, the radar instrument allows us to view the surface all the time, um, whether it's illuminated by the sun or not. We use a KU band radar, it's 2.2 centimeter wavelength, um, and uh, it observes in the same sense linear polarization. There's four modes of the radar instrument. Uh, the two, or the, the one that you're most familiar with is the SAR mode, um, and that operates uh, at closest approach on the right with these five beams that form the swath of the image. Um, and then slightly farther out, it operates in altimetry mode where it looks straight down at the surface to measure heights. So it's looking straight down at zero incidence and it measures the height of the surface. And then even farther out, we have the scatterometry mode, which scans to get uh, angular coverage um, and measure the backscatter response and um, map the backscatter back to the surface. And then um, simultaneous with all these modes, we have the radiometer, um, and it also operates even further out, which measures the brightness temperature and emissivity of the surface. So I'm just going to focus on the first two modes in this talk, even though most of my work is with the scatterometer mode. Um, so the SAR image, has, uh, the SAR imager has 
um, shown us a variety of features on Titan already. Um, and you can see that these features resemble many um, features on Earth. We have uh, fluvial channels, um, uh, wind-blown sand dunes, impact craters, chains of mountains, and cryo what look like cryovolcanic flows. And um, of interest to this talk are the, the liquid hydrocarbon lake features that we have observed. Um, this is a, the, the, a North Polar view of, of Titan. And zooming in on this one particular portion, um, where the blue are color-coded to the, the dark radar backscatter, um, which represents, um, as we've interpreted, to be liquid hydrocarbons. Um, and then we can see that there's, um, there's all these lakes of different sizes and different shapes, and there's two, two very large features that we call mare instead of lacus features. So those are more like seas. Um, and of all of this North Polar coverage, 55% has been mapped by the SAR imager, and 10% of this mapped region has been marked to be liquid, liquid hydrocarbons. In the South Polar region, on the other hand, um, this isn't color coded, so you'll just have to look for the dark spots. In particular, this one stands out. There's another one right here. Um, but you can see, I'll just I'll zoom in on this one, which is Ontario Lacus, the, the focus of this talk. But um, you can see that a stark dichotomy between the lake coverage in the north and in the south. Um, in particular, there's three different kinds of lakes um, that have been mapped by Alex Hayes. There's filled lakes, which are the darkest backscatter. There's intermediate uh, reflectivity, which are interpreted to be um, granular lakes, or mostly empty. And then there's empty lakes, which are completely dried out, but have the morphology of being once filled with fluids. So um, which, what's interesting in putting these two side by side is that you can um, really see that even though we have the same amount of coverage in both hemispheres, the, the lake distribution in the north is significantly greater than in the south. And this was um, attributed recent, in a recent paper by uh, Odetta Harrison and others um, to be attributed to orbital variations in Saturn's orbit around the sun. So this causes an asymmetry in the seasons, um, which makes the, the southern summers hotter and shorter than the northern summers. And this um, has a long-term uh, long effect over tens of thousands of years of causing the volatiles like methane and ethane to migrate to the north and stay out of the south. So this has been one explanation for why we see this huge contrast in lake coverage in the south, in between the south and north. So some other observations that of Ontario Lacus. Um, originally, it was viewed by the ISS infrared imager in 2005 and 2004. Um, and it stands out as having an extremely low albedo. Um, more recently, in 2007, the, the VIM spectrometer mapper made this image of um, different wavelengths of the surface. And of note um, was the signature of liquid ethane within the dark albedo region, um, within the lake boundary. And in addition, um, there's these perimeter uh, features um, that sort of resemble uh, past shorelines. Um, and this has been attributed to a, a time dependence in the lake level. So the lake level has been changing over the years. And uh, most recently, um, we have the SAR imager, and uh, this is in July of this past summer, June and July, um, forming a mosaic of the Ontario Lacus region. So we have the T57 flyby capturing the, um, I believe this is the northern segment, and T58 capturing the southern segment. And there's a few artifacts, like gaps in between the, in, in between the beams. Um, and we can, you know, look at, I've color-coded the, the real aperture 
sigma zero onto the lake, so you can see that it's not uniform in, over the entire lake, but rather has some, um, some surface variation. But mostly it, it, it doesn't resemble a diffuse kind of surface. In um, a recently submitted paper by uh, Wall et al., we have uh, geomorphological features that have been identified in Ontario Lacus. Um, some specific ones that I'll point out out of interest are um, these flooded valleys, this uh, smooth um, beach, the raised beach that, that um, they require to be formed by uh, wave-driven winds uh, or wind-driven waves. Um, and then some other flooded, on the other opposite shore, some flooded kind of features. So this suggests that the winds are coming from the southwest and forming this raised beach on the other side. And then with the T49 data that I'll be discussing, we have an altimeter height track. And this shows that over the lake, there's only about 10 meter variation over the 100 meters of the lake track. So one other point of interest is if you can see this dotted outline, this is what the ISS instrument observed to be the lake boundary back in 2005. So over the course of four years, it looks like the boundary of the lake has receded, um, I think it's about 10 kilometers. So Alex Hayes has um, used the, the, um, the slope information from the altimeter to measure the depth change, and he measures a depth change of one meter per year, which is pretty consistent with uh, global circulation models. So that's just a side point. So now to move into um, radar scattering theory over these lake surfaces. <coughs> if we um, are observing a smooth surface as pictured in the upper right, and we're looking at an angle, like the SAR imager does, at angles greater than 20 degrees incidence, then, if a, then the energy that we transmit will bounce specularly away in the opposite direction, so that no energy is received back at the radar instrument. On the other hand, if the surface is um, rougher, like this, what we interpret to be solid surface outside of the lake, then we have a wavelength scale roughness and other facets that are oriented towards the radar and will transmit some of that energy back at the radar. So we can interpret dark as smooth and bright as rough generally. So for the case of the T49 experiment, we've you know, changed this incidence angle so we're looking straight down and capturing that specular component from the smooth surface. And we can distinguish between a rough surface and a smooth surface by analyzing the statistics of the received echo. So for a rough surface, where you have facets oriented at, all, at, at various angles, you have many contributions to the received signal. And all of these will add up um, and form a Gaussian just distribution by the central limit theorem. On the other hand, if you have a smooth surface, then your reflecting area will be confined essentially to the first Fresnel zone, which is on the order of 100 meters for this observation. And you can imagine this Fresnel zone sort of um, reflecting the, the transmitted signal like a mirror. So we're transmitting a chirped sinusoid signal, and it's, um, if it's very smooth and coherent, then the received signal will be a replica of your transmitted uh, chirp sinusoid signal. And this is exactly what we see for this uh, T49 observation where we're, sh we're staring straight down. So offshore on the solid part of the surface we have the Gaussian statistically distributed received signal and then right over the lake we have this um, U-shaped distribution of voltage amplitudes um, which is characteristic of a sinusoidal signal. And this is a little bit asymmetric because there's a strong DC offset in, in the signal. Okay, so lake is defined as within the confines of the boundary that's defining this dark low albedo region. So it's, um, 
at the time of this observation, we didn't have SAR imagery, we just had the infrared image. Um, but we don't even have to know that there's a lake here. Um, we just look at the histograms that I've stacked vertically. So at the beginning of, of the observation, this is the histogram of one burst echo, and then propagating down as we move across the lake, we have the additional histograms. Um, and then you can see as you cross over the dark region, the histograms change remarkably into this sort of sinusoidal shape. So you don't have to know ahead of time that you're looking at a smooth lake surface. It jumps out at you when you look at the histograms. What fraction of the surface do you think has liquid? Um, well, this has been quantitatively measured. Um, I think from the SAR imagery, we've measured it to be about 18,000 square kilometers of, uh, of liquid dark area. And then that's equivalent roughly with what the ISS instrument sees. So to explain this a little, a little bit more and how we go about processing this data and retrieving results of, of smoothness or roughness, um, this is one received pulse. And you can see this is a really high frequency, so it's a little hard to resolve. But you can sort of see that it starts off at a high frequency and goes down towards a lower frequency. So this is a chirped sinusoid signal. Um, and this is what we transmit, so it's nice to see um, that it's in fact what we receive if we're expecting a, a very flat surface. But um, the data is highly quantized, which is part of the observations. So in essence, it's what we expected. But one thing that you see is that um, the, the sinusoid chirp is clipped severely. The maximum is um, sort of chopped off at this 145 level, which is the maximum um, voltage amplitude that we can measure with this quantization algorithm. So um, just to go into this a little bit more, we transmit 15 pulses, so I'll back up a second, and we receive, we transmit 21 pulses, we receive 15 pulses. So this is the square root of the power. Um, just looking at um, one pulse, this is what I showed in the previous figure, and we can um, map. Here I've stacked again the, the pulses, so there's 15 rows, one for each pulse. And the received pulse echo is almost entirely red. It's almost entirely at the maximum amplitude that it can have. So um, to explain this in a few number of words, um, we're, we're looking straight down at like a flat surface as if, if we were looking at visible wavelengths, we'd be shining our flashlight straight down and it's coming back and blinding us and saturating our receiver. And to explain what's happening with the quantization algorithm, um, this is the eight to two bit formulation. So this is what the SAR mapper uses. The altimeter actually uses eight to four bits. So it's the same idea, but a little bit more um, complicated. So you send in your eight bit signal, you <coughs> confine it to be a two bit word, you receive a two bit word plus a threshold back, at, back on earth and then you convert it back to an 8-bit word that estimates your original signal. Um, and this works fine if the signal is Gaussian, like we have for typical rough surfaces on Titan. But um, when the statistics are sinusoid, it doesn't work as well. And interestingly, if the um, signal is saturated, it works even worse, as I'll show in a second. But just to explain this a little bit more, um, the algorithm assumes that every pulse echo is, uh, is sampling the same area on the surface. So um, if you look at one individual portion of each echo, they're all sampling the same area on the surface. They all have the same statistics. So you can calculate the standard deviation and therefore the threshold that the algorithm uses, assuming Gaussian statistics. So this is the 16 words that a um, typical altimetry echo from typical Titan surface would have all 16, but um, if the signal is saturated, then it's confined to just 10 bins. So that explains 
um, part of what I showed in the quantized pulse before. But what's interesting is that the 10 bends are always the same because the threshold is maxed out to 255, which is the maximum level it can have. So, um, so it's always 10 bends, and it's always the same 10 bends. And this gives us a very simple, straightforward metric for finding these specular coherent pulses. Instead of looking for just this U-shaped character, we can just find the, the burst echoes that have most of, the, most of their energy in these 10 bends. Um, and this is what's being presented here. The percent sinusoidalness is the percent of the echo energy that's confined within these 10 bends. So as the altimeter moves across the surface, um, here it's approaching the lake, and here it's directly over the lake, and all of these are um, almost 100% within the 10 bends that define the specular signature. So um, to process this data, we use the radar equation, which depends on um, geometric observation parameters. And uh, just applying this equation blindly, the first time we got the data, we, got, we saw something like this, where the data sort of has um, the slope across the lake, and it also jumps up right in the middle of the lake. So that's kind of peculiar. What's happening is the receiver is, it has this auto gain attenuation feature. So when it detects that the signal is too high, it lowers, or it increases the attenuation so that um, it can put it back within the dynamic range of the receiver. So it's trying to do this right in the middle of the lake, um, but the 2 dB step is still not enough to bring the saturated signal back down to a measurable range. Um, and ordinarily, this would be fine because our processing calibration procedure takes the attenuation into account. Um, but for some reason, because the signal is so saturated, it's not showing a 2 dB change in the received power. So it's as if you change the attenuation, but it's the same before as it is after. So here we're introducing an artifact um, by processing the data as if it incorporated the change. And the slope is due to, I said I put that in, is due to the fact that the range from the spacecraft to the surface is changing um, sort of linearly. Um, and also the illuminated area is changing as you're getting closer, the illuminated area is getting larger. And usually these two factors are taken into account. But again, because the signal is so saturated, it's not changing with these observation parameters. And we're introducing artifacts by correcting them when they're not in fact there. So in order to um, correct our correction, we um, hold these parameters constant. And you can choose from the, you can choose different parameters. You can choose right before the attenuation change, right after the range at the beginning, the range at the end, and so on. And essentially, we, we decide to take the, the burst parameters that give us the lowest bound on sigma zero, because this, in fact, gives us the highest bound on our roughness constraint. So um, this just shows the range that sigma zero might have, depending on uh, which parameters you take into account. But you can see that it levels off, as it should, and there's no jump with the attenuation. <coughs> so the gray level is what we're calculating to be sigma zero. When I say <coughs> sigma zero, that's normalized radar cross-section. It's a measure of the reflectivity normalized uh, by the illuminated area. So um, this is a, a very low bound on sigma zero. We expect that it's much, much higher. The reflectivity should be much, much higher than this. And uh, we try to improve this bound by understanding what's happening within the receiver when the signal, signal is saturating uh, the receiver. Um, sort of at the back end, we have this uh, quantizer and uh, BAQ, the, the, the compressor algorithm operating. But before that, we have something that's sort of um, distorting the echo based on the saturation. So we're, here we're going through and simulating how the received signal is changed um, within the receiver um, and how we can understand the signal that we receive. 
So uh, typically, when you when you clip quantize a signal, um, it's ideally it's a linear response in between the clipped points, and then it's a hard clip um, at the maximum and min. And what I'll show in the next slide, we're actually observing something that is more like a soft clipper. So something in the saturation is changing the um, the uh, characteristics of the receiver. So for example, if we look at the histogram of the received signal shown in black, where the circles are the 10 quantized bends that I described earlier, if we um, simulate what's happening and just do a hard clipper that's shown in blue, we can't replicate the level and the shape of the histogram at the same time. Um, but with a soft clipper, we can replicate it pretty much exactly. So the idea is um, to simulate, throw in a, a sinusoidal signal of some variable amplitude, simulate the effects of the receiver, and back out the amplitude of the signal, even though it's clipped. So here we have our measured uh, amplitude of the sinusoid, and here we have our estimated amplitude of the sinusoid based on matching the shape of the histogram. And the blue is the hard clip, and the red, or the purple is the soft clip. Um, so this is an extreme difference between the measured and the estimated sinusoid amplitude. And we can check this with some engineering data that we threw into our T56 flyby. And here we're transmitting a signal and um, feeding it directly back into the receiver. So um, it's not, in fact, transmitted by the antenna. It's just looped back into the receiver. So we can change the, the attenuation or change the level of the received signal. And we see that as the attenuation decreases or the signal level gets higher, it does, um, sa it does saturate. You, you can't tell the, anymore the difference between the signal levels. On the left is 8 to 8, so no quantization. And on the right is this 8 to 4 bit quantization that we're using in the altimetry mode. So we can apply our estimation algorithm that backs out the original amplitude from the clip signal to this data, the engineering data. This is not actual surface data. And the black line is what we would expect. As we change the attenuation of this looped back signal, um, this is the this is the amplitude of the sinusoid um, that as it should be affected by the attenuation change. So it should be a one to one mapping. You're changing the input signal and the output signal should be along this black line. The purple line is what we're estimating. So as we go through this simulation algorithm to um, pull out the original amplitude from the clip signal, we're overestimating the um, sinusoidal amplitude. So we can use this information that the fa of the fact that our estimation tool is not working <laughs> to make it, to clamp it down and make it work a little bit better. So instead of um, having a clip amplitude of 145, we can move it up a little bit and just um, clamp it down at this 210 level. And that may not have made any sense, and that's OK because um, I'm going to show you uh, here what we're doing. So the black level is what we're measuring. This is, the, um, in essence, the, the power of the signal that we're receiving. Um, and we're able to move the clip level up just a little bit, trying to uh, match the characteristics of the histogram. So what does this do for us? Here is the. Um, the sigma zero, the normalized radar cross-section, um, where we've corrected for this little bit of um, saturation that we were able to back out. Um, and it shows, as we expect, the, the signal jumps to an extremely bright level over the lake. On the left is the infrared image. On the right is the SAR radar image. And um, more or less, the bright reflectivity is within the confines of the boundary defined in these images. So if we pick out our specular points, the points that are confined to the 10 quantization bends, 
um, then radar theory says that for a spherical surface, the radar cross-section should, um, should be equal to this. It's proportional to the, the target radius, which is 2575 kilometers for Titan, the range to the surface, which is about uh, 1900, 2000 kilometers in this observation, and the Fresnel reflectivity. Um, but if the surface is not a smooth sphere, um, then we have um, an additional factor introduced that is a function of the surface height roughness. And this will tend to attenuate the radar cross-section, which is explained in this figure. So as you're looking straight down at this smooth, coherent surface, um, you might have little uh, surface elements that are offset from each other, and they'll tend to interfere um, destructively. So if it's completely flat, then you get the radar cross-section that you expect from the theory. But as the, the surface roughness increases, these um, heights destructively interfere, and the reflectivity decreases exponentially. And um, so we can take our, our uh, radar cross-section values and compute the roughness based on this formula. And this is what is shown here. Assuming different Fresnel reflectivities or different dielectric constants that are reasonable for a lake surface, uh, 1.6 to 1.9 is what we would expect for li liquid hydrocarbons. 2.4 would be solid hydrocarbons if it was frozen over. Um, and these points are the specular only points. So they're the echoes that show their energy is confined to this U-shaped 10 quantization histogram um, characteristic. And what we measure is that um, for these different compositions, the surface roughness has to be less than three millimeters in RMS height. And this is over the horizontal distance of the Fresnel zone, which is only 100 meters or a tenth of the footprint of the radar. Um, so it's important to remember that this is high upper bound because, as I explained, our signal is saturated and we can only measure the lower end of the radar cross section, even though we tried to correct it um, a little bit. We it's still an extreme upper bound on roughness because it's a lower bound on radar cross-section. And what this suggests is it, for it to have this uh, surface so smooth, um, there aren't any waves present. There aren't any uh, gravity waves or capillary waves. So what does this, um, well, as an aside, the, um, the VIMS image that I talked about at the beginning um, if you look at the reflectivity versus air mass uh, plot, as you go towards zero air mass, the reflectivity approaches zero. And this suggests that it too um, is observing an Ontario lacus that is smooth and quiescent and absent of any scattering centers larger than a few microns. So these data sets are agreeing with each other. So what does a smooth surface without any waves imply about uh, wind conditions and properties of the material. Well, for Titan, um, we, would, we expect waves to be generated fairly easily um, because the air is much denser. It's four times denser than it is at Earth. Um, so Lorenz et al. in a recently submitted paper estimates that the threshold for capillary wave generation is reduced to 0.5 meters per second. So you need an, a wind speed of 0.5 meters per second to generate ca capillary waves. So the absence of capillary waves implies that the wind was less than 0.5 meter per second, or one meter per second if the threshold is higher. Um, and also if this material is um, pure liquid hydrocarbon, like methane, ethane, nitrogen, then the material has a lower density and lower viscosity than water on Earth, and that should facilitate wave generation. So those two effects are saying that winds should be extremely easy and uh, to generate on Titan and, and observable. 
Um, here are some laboratory data done by uh, Lorenz et al. in 2005 um, that shows that for lower pressures, or for higher pressures, remember Titan is 50% um, higher pressure than Earth. Um, the, so for, as the pressure gets higher, the wave heights get larger. So um, if that was the only thing that was changed, you would expect larger waves. Um, and in addition, you, as you go to lower viscosity or lower density liquid materials, it also generates larger waves at lower wind speeds. So these are a couple things to keep in mind. And also, the lower gravity on Titan aids wave generation. Um, once you've reached the capillary wave stage, it can propagate to gravity waves, and the lower gravity will aid in making the waves seven times larger than they are on Earth. So models that take some of these factors into account suggests that um, for one meter per second winds, which is what was measured at the Huygens landing site, the, um, the RMS wave height of, of liquid material should be about 2.5 centimeters, which is an order magnitude larger than we've constrained it to be. To um, replicate our constraint, the wind speed has to be about 0.3 meter per second. And this, is, this model is not taking all of those um, liquid properties into account, it's just um, gravity and a couple other things. So there should be waves. Um, the, the SAR image of Ontario Lacus suggests there was a wave generated beach. So that suggests that there was once waves. So um, what's happening at the time of this observation? Well, um, it, this is nicely explained in a, in a another recent paper by Lorenz et al. <laughs> um, he takes the threshold wind speed for capillary wave generation on Earth, which is between one and two meter per second, and he scales it just by considering the air density and um, says it's more like 0.5 to one meter per second. So you can look at um, global wind models of the wind speeds at the times of our observation and see whether it's below or, above or below this threshold. And um, if this threshold is reached and capillary waves are generated, then you could expect gravity waves as high as 20 centimeters. So um, that's another thing. But this wave threshold can be impeded um, based on the liquid properties. And I'll describe that at the end. So this is a um, global circulation model generated by Claire Newman um, that the Lorenz et al. paper uses. And it, the, the x-axis is solar longitude. So at the time of our observation on the far right, the wind speeds were expected to be less than 0.5 meter per second. So if this is, in fact, the threshold for capillary wave generation, then we were below it at the time of our observation. So this could explain why we don't see waves. Um, and then for all future observations of this feature, the wind speeds are expected to stay low. Now, considering um, northern polar lakes, which um, we're moving into the north, northern summer, so um, where we've been observing in this area where the wind speeds have also been expected to be low, in future observations, the wind speeds should be much higher um, and we should begin to see some of these wind roughened sur surface effects. Um, so one side point is, as you might, if you're attending AGU this year, um, you might see a talk by Stefan et al. And where the VIMS instrument has uh, detected a specular signature from a northern lake, Kraken Mare. Um, and this observation is, is made at, um, it looks like a wind speed that's predicted to be at w about one meter per second. So the upper range of that um, capillary wave generation threshold. So the VIMS, which is sensitive to even smaller wavelengths than radars, 2.2 centimeters, um, is seeing what looks like a smooth surface um, at the time of this, of this range. <coughs> so um, if you take into account these liquid properties, 
um, you might see that the wave generation threshold changes by maybe more than a factor of two um, if the viscosity is higher, uh, which can happen um, if you dissolve heavy hydrocarbons of higher viscosity into the liquid ethane, methane, nitrogen mixture. Um, the viscosity is, has been measured to be five times larger than the pure hydrocarbons. Um, and then you can also have suspended sediment um, like tholin haze that's very fine grained, so it has a low uh, suspension or low sedimentation velocity and um, can significantly increase the viscosity of the material. So, um, it, and then that um, asymmetric effect where northern lakes are more prevalent than southern lakes, which was explained by orbital configuration uh, effects. Um, that can cause the, the materials in the southern lakes to be more thick um, because the pure ethane and methane has been driven to the north by the evaporation. So um, just to show what can happen if you have a lot, as your volume fraction of suspended particles approaches a significant fraction, maybe 40, 50 percent of the material, the viscosity diverges and in fact can cause the material to, um, to, to gel or to no longer flow. So these are just uh, different things to keep into account. Um, so in summary, we've measured a specular signature over Ontario Lacus um, and use that to um, place an upper bound on the smoothness and um, interpreted this to uh, be consistent with models that suggest that there were hardly uh, enough winds to generate waves at the time of the observation, but um, may or may not require more viscous material than, than um, can be considered. Okay, so I'll take any questions. take another crack. It's sort of related to what I asked, but uh, you said that you uh, think that there had to be waves because you make a beach on the other side, so the wind blows the one way. So um, let me back up to that figure. Could it be that it's not uh, waves, that is just you're blowing stuff off to the other side, like just particles? Um, so I'm just going by what's in, what's in this paper, they, their argument is that because you see these sort of parallel features along the beach, um, that it represents a, uh, a wave generated beach and it has that raised smooth aspect that you would see on earth beaches that are also wave generated. So um, it's possible that there's other explanations to cause this morphological beach feature, but this is this is outside of my area, and I, I, I think that they've considered it in the paper and have arrived at the conclusion that it's wind generated. This is really interesting work. Um, I'm wondering, I saw you mentioned the emissivity data only briefly. Um, can that be used to tell you anything more about composition or compositional variations maybe across these features? I'm, a, I'm glad you asked that because I didn't mention in the slide. Um, so I mentioned that radiometry uh, is acquired or brightness temperature is acquired at the same time as our active data. So when SAR made this image, it also has an image at the, at the footprint resolution of, uh, of brightness temperature. So. Um, what um, this is done by Mike Jansen and Elise Legal. Um, they've determined that this brightness temperature of 88.5, if you make an assumption about composition, um, gives you a surface temperature that is consistent, slightly lower than what is measured by the Sears instrument at these, at these latitudes. But in order to go from one to the other, you have to make an assumption about the composition um, with polarization data you could constrain the composition but without 
with only one set of data, you have to make an assumption. And uh, one other question. Um, if there were actually waves in these features, would you, would you still see them as you know, smooth, discrete features, or would they kind of blend into the background if the roughness increased? So this is something we're thinking about right now as we expect there to be more winds in our future observations in the north. Um, we should expect that if we saw a lake in the north like, like, uh, um, like Giamari or Krakenmari, they're extremely black to radar. We might expect them to change reflectivity. If the, if the wind is kicking up waves, it should be a lot brighter because it's a rougher surface. Um, it may or may not be as bright as the surrounding surface depending on, um, on the roughness. So that's something that will be monitoring closely soon. Lauren, you mentioned that you were working on data from uh, other modes of the instrument as well. Can you give us a flavor of, of what other work you've been doing yeah. on those? Yeah. Um, so let's see. So I've been working um, up until this altimetry observation. I've been processing um, the, the radar cross-section over the beam footprint resolution, what we call real aperture, um, originally starting with the scatterometry mode, um, but also applying this to the altimetry and the SAR mode. So what this allows us to do is um, do something like this, where we can plot the radar cross-section as a function of incidence angle. and um, this doesn't really say anything because the, the data is at, at the noise floor, so it doesn't really give us much information. But um, on another part of Titan, we might expect the reflectivity to drop off with incidence angle, and the way that it drops off is a function of composition and surface roughness. So we can apply models to the back, what we call the backscatter curve um, to say something more about surface. So I've been looking at specific features on Titan and constraining based on their backscatter response with incidence angle, um, their different composition and roughness properties. And does the, does the radar instrument actually uh, take data on every pass, uh, pass Titan, it's always on? It's no, it's, um, it's sort of in competition with the other instruments. So I think it usually works out to be um, maybe one out of two or one out of four flybys we get radar data on. Okay. But you're definitely guaranteed those ones that you mentioned before, the, the ones that in higher, higher wind periods. Yeah, the, um, the ones at the, in the last figure that I showed are upcoming radar observations where we're expecting to see some of these wind effects, too many slides, <laughs> here we go. So um, in January we have this T65 observation over Ontario Lacus. This is not an altimetry <laughs> observation so we can't repeat our experiment with a better attenuation in order to get an unsaturated signal. This will be a SAR observation. Um, but it should look very similar to the SAR observation we already have. Um, and then coming up, we have 264 uh, in a few weeks over Kraken Mare. And um, um, something that someone might be wondering is whether we can repeat this altimetry roughness measurement on other lakes. The only opportunity we have in the future to do this <laughs> is Ligia Mare. Um, in the year 2000, I think it's 13. So it will be a few years before we have estimates over that lake. And does that continue, will that be encompassed in the, uh, uh, the extended yeah, Cassini the mission? Yeah, the XXM, the extended, extended mission. <laughs> Um, yeah, just to follow up on the uh, the question about uh, whether or not measurements are taken every time, like what are the constraints to uh, taking those measurements and why they're done, like one out of every five passes? So I missed the first part. Which measurements? 
Oh, um, I think uh, the internet asked about, um, I think, what is it, the SAR? SAR? I, I can't remember which one. Um, yeah, you mentioned now only one out of five uh, passes oh, measurements. Flybys, yeah. Flybys, yes. Um, what are the con constraints to making those measurements? Like so why, are why you asking how do they decide what flyby goes to radar versus yes. other yeah. instruments? Yes. Um, I think it's, well, it's a combination of science and politics. <laughs> so the instruments lobby for specific observations when they want to observe a specific area at a certain geometry. Um, and then um, you just balance the different requests from the different instruments. Um, of course, there's other instruments that aren't imagers that are also um, looking at different things in surface. Surface is all that I can think about, so I don't know what they would consider. So it basically comes down to how they want to point the spacecraft. Point yeah, flying, um, flying so by. the spacecraft, the instruments are sort of positioned around the spacecraft, so um, sometimes it works out that only one instrument can view the surface at a time. Um, so you can't you can't point all the instruments at the same time. And also there's data volume constraints and all that. Okay, thank you. If you want the historical background as to why you can't do that, it's that Cassini has no scan platform. And that was de-scoped back in like the 90s, back when Cassini was almost canceled. The, it, um, kind of the, the compromise was that they chopped a bunch of money out of its budget, which meant that you could still fly the spacecraft, but you had to have the instruments pointing in different directions. Basically, the radar is pointing one way, all the rest of the optical instruments are pointing the other way. So you can either point the spacecraft, you can either point the radar at, the pl at your satellite you're flying by, or you can point the cameras. You can't point both. So that's why it's this complicated dance between passes for radar versus passes for other imaging stuff. If you use the uh, the regular angle instead of the, the straight down, mm -hmm. what uh, sort of limits can you get on the roughness? Um, so this is something I'm investigating at the moment, but um, you can, so using the, the SAR data or the real aperture data f um, from higher incidence angles, um, let's say, let's look at this image. Um, so you can, there's different models that um, have radar reflectivity as a function of surface roughness and depending on how small that roughness is, you'll use a different model. Um, but in all models, you need to know something about um, material properties um, and like whether you're looking through the liquid and sensing the bottom, there's those kind of constraints. But um, Theory says that you should be able to put a bound on roughness from reflectivity at higher angles. So this is something that we're still looking at. So I guess the bottom line is in those uh, observations that you predicted to have higher winds, uh, will you be able to see the, yes. uh, the um, effect? So this is one area where there should be higher winds and we would expect that, um, for instance, what's colored blue here might be colored tan. Because it's not dark, it, will be, it might be as bright as the solid surface. And by uh, the altimeter information, you'll be able to tell whether it's less liquid as opposed to change in roughness? Yes. Um, well, no. I think if we use the same kind of altimetry observation over a wind rough in Northern Lake as we will do in 2013, um, instead of getting these sinusoidal histograms, you should get a Gaussian histogram because um, it's essentially the same as what's happening on the solid surface. All of the different reflections are adding up um, at, at, to the central limit theorem and giving you a Gaussian. Right. Do you get um, altimetry information at the same time? You'll get height information. I don't think it has the resolution to actually measure the peak to trough um, height calculation of the waves. So uh, as, we, um, as we saw over Ontario Lacus, you'll essentially just get a flat plane, I would expect. Right, but could you tell if the lake got empty? Um, depending on the bottom of the lake. Depending on how deep the lake is, right. 
Well, if the if there was no liquid, you would be observing the bottom. Right. Um, and if it's flat, then it might look the same as if there was liquid. You couldn't tell the difference. Uh, if they are, uh, if the lake levels are going down at Ontario Larkus, are there other lakes that you're seeing going up in level? Uh, Pretty much what all of our observations have shown in the southern hemisphere is a tendency towards emptying. So in the few, very few other lakes in the south region, um, we've s we have seen changes in the reflectivity, but the changes always imply that it's going from filled to empty. And this is in a paper by Alex Hayes that has been submitted to Icarus, so um, sometime out in the next year. And is the same thing happening in the north? or is we I don't know that we have the overlapping data to say at the moment whether there's whether it's changing or not. But we should be, um, since we're moving into northern summer, we should be seeing similar effects that we've been seeing in the south, where the methane is evaporating and the lakes are emptying. And the situation reversing. In the yeah. Summer, right? okay. More or less. <laughs> right. Well, if there's no further questions, if you'll. Uh, Oh, I have a special um, token of our appreciation of you coming along to uh, the SETI Institute today. Oh, thank you. And if you'll uh, thank me, Owen, uh, thanking Lauren very much for her interesting talk. <laughs>